welcome to all of you. Um, last May, Tom Mayer wrote his farewell article as an investigative reporter at Newsday before moving on to the editorial board, where he is a columnist. Oh, and also, on the side, preparing as author and producer, and a producer, uh, a six-part docu-series, Mafia Spies, for Paramount Plus, based on his book of the same name. And he has a novel coming out this summer. He already has, to his name, an Emmy Award-winning Showtime drama, Masters of Sex, based on another of his seven books, I think it is. Uh, um, and uh, that's so far. Um, the title of that book, by the way, was the answer to a Jeopardy question last month, which is the ultimate sign that you have made it. <laughs> uh, and uh, he's also written books about the Kennedys, the Churchills, and the Kennedy the Churchills and the Kennedys, Dr. Spock, and the Newhouse Journalism Empire. He has won many awards, including the National Society of Professional Journalists um, Top Reporting Prize twice, the Columbia University uh, Journalism School's Alumni Award for Career Achievement in 2022, uh, a Silurians, and just the just this year, um, a, a Silurians Ex Excellence in Journalism Merit Award in the Arts and, Cul and Culture Reporting for uh, The Godfather 50 Years Later. I've known Tom for many years. I worked at Newsday for 33 years and uh, before leaving 16 years ago, and he has been there 40 years. Um, April. In April, okay. Um, I have long admired his work, though I've never understood how he does it all, and so well, while remaining a very nice guy, uh, self-effacing and generous in helping fellow journalists. And now he's going to tell us more about his projects and illustrating it um, with video, and how we too can enter the world of primetime TV. I'll give you Tom May. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. You know, I was talking to Joe at, at, during the lunch, and I was saying how much uh, the Silurians, to me, was always meant big league journalism here in New York, um, that they also gave the best dinner of all the awards uh, Silurians always had the nicest dinner, the best cocktail hour, and such. Uh, my f first award was back in 1990, and it was for kind of a, a tough series for New York Newsday. And uh, I, it just meant a lot that the Silurians recognized the value of that. As Eileen said uh, recently uh, with the Godfather thing, but the th when I th think of the Silurians, the thing that I think about most is um, in the 70s, I was a student with a, 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 a ki another kid named Jim Dwyer, who uh, we were on a student paper up at Fordham up in the Bronx. And we, both, we had a teacher there whose family, he was a Jesuit priest. He uh, was the author of a number of books. Uh, he had a profound impact on Dwyer uh, in terms of as a journalist and such. His family used to own, were well, the last owners of the old Brooklyn, of the Brooklyn Eagle, you may remember the Brooklyn Eagle and such. So uh, Ray Schroth was his name and he was, a ve he was about six foot four and we were walking up the hill from Fordham up to the D train up in the Bronx and as the teacher would ask, essentially, what do you want to do when you grow up? And he first asked Dwyer and I remember Dwyer said he wanted to be like Jimmy Breslin. And then he asked me, he said, who do you want to be like when you grow up, you know, journalistically? And I said, Bob Green at Newsday. And they both turned and said, who's that? Uh, well, they both learned later on. But the reason why I, I, we went to that night to the Silurians, and when we 
came in, it wasn't at the same place. I forget where it would have been in the, the late 70s. But it, again, it was a, a lovely cocktail hour and such. And we, um, I, I don't know how the teacher got t tickets for that, but he brought two students. And for, for me, the Silurians have always been kind of that ideal of, of uh, big league journalism. And, and uh, so it's always been in the back of my mind. And I thank you, particularly Eileen, for putting this together. Thank you so much for inviting me today. <laughs> Essentially, what I'm going to try to talk about today is uh, uh, I've spent the majority of my career as a print writer, uh, print journalist. But particularly in recent years, I've, I've gotten more and more involved with, with television. Um, as I mentioned, that Jesuit, um, Ray Schroth, that I talked about at Fordham, he, t he taught a class about American biography. And we had to read a, a biography a week, which I'm sure is no big deal for Dan Pryor uh, in the audience, right? Uh, but, um, but that was a big deal back then. And, um, but in many ways, my book writing career is an extension of that class. It's just, it's always been about America in, in our time, fundamentally. And that's what I've tried to write about. Um, when I went to Columbia Journalism School, though, I, was, I had worked for two years at a, a, a Gannett paper up in Rockland, and I was determined at C Columbia Journalism School to learn about television, to learn those set of skills. And I remember my advisor said, Tom, you don't want to do that, at, 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 particularly the second half of the year. He said, you don't want to do that, stay in print. And even at, for many, many years, and it's, I think it's still to some extent true in the profession, that you're either print or you're broadcast. And I think we are, particularly in the last 20 years, increasingly a multimedia world, and particularly the, uh, the succeeding generations of journalists have realized that, and they've, they've, they've acquired more and more multimedia skills. So I did do that at Columbia. This is like 1982, and we sold a documentary. It was called The Mob, The Merchants, and the Fulton Fish Market, and we, we cribbed liberally from Bob Green and Tom Renner's clips from Newsday, and we sold it at the Columbia Journalism School to Channel 13. They showed it in, in uh, June of 1982. But I got a job at the Chicago Sun-Times, and I worked there for two years until Murdoch bought the paper, and then three of us landed at Newsday, where I worked uh, particularly for Rich Gallant for a, n a number of years, and we did a lot of different projects. And th th in many ways, that was the heyday of Newsday. Newsday is still making money and still doing well. I don't want to give a misimpression mm -hmm. there, but but there was a lot of talent there in that room in the 1980s, both out on Long Island and uh, and then uh, at New York Newsday, um, and. Working for Green, I was the last one on the Bob Green's investigative team. And with Green, and I had this conversation with Ro no less than Robert Caro, who actually worked with Green and has written about that. But when you work for Green, he really was a master investigative reporter, but he was a great teacher as well. And the, the, the business of how to put together a book and, and putting together chronologies and seeing things, uh, that was part of the the hallmark of Green's training. Caro, I saw him about five or six years ago out in the Hamptons at an event, and we talked about that. And it was like as if you had gotten a chip in your, placed in your head that Bob had put in. And so in many ways, I think we're all very fortunate who work, who work with Bob in that regard. But at the same time, we had, in the project, uh, Rich and I worked on a project for more than a year. Uh, with a, and the other editor on the project was Newsday's writing coach, a fellow named uh, uh, Harvey Aronson. And t the idea that, the news, that Newsday had a writing coach, and they actually had to think about your writing. Oh, no, it's not a reflexive thing. You actually have to think before you write. That was both those sets of skills uh, were something that was um, a big part of the determination to write books. And so, as Eileen has mentioned, I've written a number of different books. Slowly along the way, um, I was exposed more and more to something that I intended to do out of Columbia, which is 
uh, do television as well. So when I wrote a book about Dr. Spock, the baby doctor, uh, in the 1990s, the BBC made a documentary of that, and I was a part of that, so I got a little bit of a taste about by that. Also, the, the Dolans bought Newsday um, about 15 years ago, and I did a lot of projects, in fact, one won a Silurian Award uh, back in 2014 with News 12, which is their local news thing. And uh, Pat Dolan, who is the oldest son of Charles Dolan, the founder of Cablevision, but Pat is the owner of Newsday. Um, he was the, then the director of news for News 12. So I did a lot of projects with him. And so I learned a lot about script writing. Uh, I did a lot of video editing and you learn about the grammar of film. So it was around that same time that I wrote a book uh, that was actually an assignment I didn't want to do. Uh, I came in one day and they said, you know, hey, Maya, we want to do a, our own story on Dr. Masters. You know, that sex guy who uh, he's retiring and get him on the horn and see if he could do something. So I got him on the horn. And I was, on the, I was writing a book about Dr. Spock at, at the time. And uh, I got off the phone. I said, wow, a man? and a woman who are not married, studying love and sex, not necessarily in that order, who get married, they're married for 20 years, they become world famous, they become the go-to source on all of this thing, the sexual revolution, and then they get divorced, and nobody knows why. And it, I said, well, that's a, you know, that's a book. And sure enough, I, uh, when the book came out, uh, that old New York Times uh, uh, ad that said, I got my job from the New York Times. Well, I got my TV series through the New York Times. They reviewed it uh, on the Daily. Dwight Gardner, thank you, Dwight, uh, gave a very lovely review on Friday. And then on Saturday, uh, Sunday, uh, the Sunday book review came out. So in one weekend, I, I had two reviews in the Times. So we had a couple of different people knocking on the doors, and I actually said, uh-uh, I want it as a movie. And once again, I was an error. Uh, I, I was talked into, slowly but surely, a person at Sony who had worked for Jason Epstein at Random House. She was now a Hollywood producer. Uh, and she said, no, this, basically she said, this is the golden age of television. There's not only The Sopranos, but look at Mad Men. Mad Men was particularly the go-to example. <clears throat> Excuse me, during that time period, to be honest, I was so busy. We have three kids, my wife Joyce. Hello there, Joyce. Uh, and I had three kids. I barely watched television. So uh, I watched Mad Men. Oh, now I get, I get it with Mad Men. So we went with Sony, and they developed it, and they sold it to Showtime, and what I didn't realize at that, at that point was that this was kind of the golden age of cable television, and that's a distinctly different time, although, although it's only 10 years ago, um, it's a very different time than what the age that we're living in right now. But let me just show you, if I can, just a quick clip, and I hope I haven't totally screwed this up. Bill Masters was a tough, tough, ambitious, uh, hard-driving doctor, probably the best doctor in St. Louis, certainly in the OBGYN field. God may have created the heavens and earth, but he's not an obstetrician. He was also a fertility expert as well. We've been trying for six months since the wedding night. And there were couples who were having difficulty conceiving, uh, looking to have a baby, and he would help them. So you have uh, intercourse regularly? Pretty much like rabbits. Honey. And it's actually out of that work that kind of helped inspire his interest in sexuality and, and understanding how the body works. There are libraries on how babies are born, and not a single study on how babies are made. I think the most important thing to understand with Masters is his ambition. We are doctors, for Christ's sakes, and I, I simply want to answer the question, what happens to the body during sex? Behind all that ambition was a man who had a troubled childhood, who was very much determined 
to make a name for himself. He wanted to win a Nobel Prize. I want to make my name in uncharted territory. I, I want a Nobel Prize. And I think that ambition, the hurt from his own childhood, was some of the fuels that drove Bill Masters to become the famous character that he did indeed become. So that, that clip was uh, made by Sony as part of the whole, um, the whole aspect of, of uh, promoting the show. After that show, that show ran for four years. I learned a lot from that. We, Joyce and I would go out to uh, Los Angeles uh, every summer and that's when they were filming it and it, it, they let us sit right behind the directors and we got to know Michael Apted. I don't know if you knew Michael Apted or recognize him, but he became a friend and actually gave Joyce a kiss uh, and said, how about we try to get rid of this guy, pointing to me. <laughs> uh, but uh, Michael is deceased, but he, he did the 7-Up uh, uh, series, and he was a lovely man. But I learned a lot of things about the business <coughs> and such. One of the things, so one of the things I learned about Hollywood, which is different, you know, newspaper, you write for a newspaper, there's the general, then there's the colonel, then there's the captains, corporates, and usually the reporters are the buck privates or whatever, you know, <laughs> go out there and fire or whatever. But it's a very hierarchical structure. Book writing is different because an idea can make, it's, it's, it's a flatter uh, uh, hierarchy. And I also noticed that about Hollywood to some extent as well, that there's two letters that are very important in uh, Hollywood. It's called IP. Uh, what's IP? Intellectual property. In other words, your book is that property. They refer to it as IP now. They don't even call it intellectual property. It's IP. Oh, very good IP. He gives very good IP. Um, and um, so having that IP, I noticed that suddenly p people were asking me, what else do you have, kid? You know, you had what, this is a sh TV show that's a hit. And so that was a very <laughs> eye-opening experience when we were out there as well. Um, one of the things that I sold to, Eileen uh, I, I had mentioned that I wrote a book about the new houses. And um, I wrote that as, up as a treatment and sold it to Sony. Uh, and then um, I also sold to Sony a book that I did right around that same time about the Churchills and the Kennedys. Kind of like The Crown, if you've watched The Crown at all. It's kind of like the same type of, uh, type of, uh, drama and, and such. Um, and actually that also went to, at one point, to uh, Warner Brothers as well. Uh, but at lunch, uh, particularly when I talk about suddenly with IP and they say, what else do you, what else do you have, kid? Uh, we were invited to lunch uh, twice, uh, by two different summers, uh, by Peter Roth, who, uh, for those of you who uh, know Newsday, reminded me of Howie Schneider. Uh, kind of an impresario, you know, uh, and, uh, and we went to lunch and he actually introduced me to Chuck Lorre, who made millions for, for Warner Brothers, and he, he was so proud of, to introduce me to uh, Chuck Lorre. I had no idea who Chuck Lorre is, which I'm sure was, um, but I have subsequently learned uh, a lot about Chuck Lorre. But at, at lunch with Peter, he said, so, um, so you sold the Churchill Kennedys to, to Sony's. We wanted it, but do you have any other ideas? What, what else are you working on these days? And I said, well, what I'm working on, but I haven't written a single word yet, is um, two gangsters hired by the CIA to kill Castro and what happened to them. And it had been kicking around in the back of my mind and for a while, and he said, great. Let's do it. I said, Peter, I haven't written the book yet. Uh, so, no, let's do it. We'll put it in the contract. Book TK, TK. <laughs> uh, book to come, to come. Uh, right, I, I, and we flew back to New York like my head was spinning by it. So, okay, so we, we uh, that beca became its own story. 
Uh, and uh, it didn't work out with Warner Brothers. And eventually, uh, when the book finally did come out, uh, it was bought by Danny Strong, who's done a lot of different uh, productions. He, he most recently did for Hulu uh, Dope Sick, which is a terrific series, but he also has won the Emmys for HBO. So he's my, he's my go-to guy these days. He's my closest uh, uh, compadre. And he bought it, and then COVID came along, and Danny was going to try to do Mafia Spies. The name of the book is called Mafia Spies. And um, we were hoping that it would be a drama, but it's really hard to tell people in Hollywood during COVID that, oh, we want to go to Cuba, we want to go to Las Vegas, we want it. Uh, and so he couldn't sell it as a drama. And I was in a meeting of Newsday's investigative team uh, when I got a phone call in the middle of the meeting from Danny. And I went up, we were all working from home, so I went into uh, another room and he said, I sold it as a documentary. And I guess I'm, I'm really a very poor, poor actor. And he, he could just tell from the little catch in my voice. I said, oh, and he said, it's all right with you, right, that we sold it. And, um, and I have to say, I was, again, kind of like with the movie, I wanted a movie with Masters. I said, oh, you know, I didn't say it to Danny, but um, I was dubious. And, but as it turned out, it, it's gone from uh, eventually to now Paramount Plus in the world of streaming. And that has been uh, a really interesting uh, aspect. Before I forget, I just want to show you the clip. That, so it just gives you a taste of Mafia Spies for a second. It's an incendiary fuel that's gonna blow. One of the most difficult things in telling this story. So that's uh, the beginning of, they actually have a teaser and then they have the graphics and it starts at our house, um, kind of basically uh, saying, uh, what I basically say there is that everybody lies um, in this story and they do. Um, but in any event, so my point with this is saying that this is a whole new world than 10 years ago with Masters uh, of Sex, which was the golden age of cable television. Now it's streaming. And there are a, lot of, a lot of people are flying by the seat of their pants these days, trying to figure out how they grab audiences. This, we recently got our report card. They do audience surveys with this. <clears throat> and it got very good, uh, uh, a very good report card. So, because uh, it kind of fits the audience of, you know, they, Paramount owns The Godfather, they had the offer, if anybody saw that, on, on Paramount Plus. So it kind of fits that, uh, their brand, as they say. Um, just to uh, make a couple of quick suggestions about, uh, for those who may be interested in trying to, can, uh, to uh, translate their print, their IP, mm -hmm. Uh, into television or film. I just wanted to mention a couple of things. One is um, most of my uh, uh, career, my uh, professional life, has been as a lone wolf investigative reporter. In fact, actually, I once went to lunch with 
with Rich and said, please let me work alone. That was the upshot of, that was the upshot of the, it, no meetings, fewer meetings, I'll get it to you faster, I promise, I promise. Uh, television is completely different. It's a collaborative process, it's trying to find out, you know, uh, 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 the 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 group of talents how that also writing for the eye um, I think that's good advice regardless wh of whether or not your your book becomes or your article becomes a TV series or not the cinematic aspect th that those moments that are cinematic just they're often very descriptive and writing for the eye uh, ultimately television you realize it's all about the writing as well it's the script it's it's it, it's something that I didn't think was necessarily important, but writers really, really, showrunners are given a great deal of freedom in television. Um, the other thing is framing something. M Mafia Spies is not a particularly new idea. There was stuff that I got from the JFK assassination papers that uh, President Trump uh, released uh, about five years ago, and, and some of that uh, helped inform my book. But that story has been out there for a while. But it was framed around the two gangsters. And so in many ways, like in Hollywood speak, it was kind of Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, you know, the two uh, meet Godfather uh, part two. Uh, that like as the background of it. And that's really the story of, of uh, Sam Giancana, who was the head of the mob. And his buddy was this guy, was a mob's guy out in Los Hollywood and then in Las Vegas. A uh, guy named Johnny Roselli, and that he was the one who really uh, caught my eye. So it's their relationship, these two buddies, two very different types of men as men, uh, but also blo very bloody killers. But Johnny was a really suave guy. I mean, Johnny uh, worked for Harry Cohn at, at Columbia Pictures. He dated Lana Turner. Donna Reed, he dated, you know. <laughs> oh my God, uh, you know. So those two, uh, you know, the, the idea of having these two buddies and you follow them over the the course of this thing, that's the grabber for me. And that, so framing any story, any project, I think is really key. Um, in pitching something, somebody already asked me uh, today uh, about pitching and, and, and about translating a book. One of the things I learned is I had a pilot of Masters of Sex, and there's lots of other books about how to write, how to write a script, but when I pitched a book, uh, what I would do is give them about a 10-page memo. And it first had to do, the first two or three pages had to do with the pilot. Then another two or three pages, uh, that, that were just paragraphs, <coughs> elaborated paragraphs of the key characters, because television's so character-driven. And then, and then the back half of it, the back third of it, had to do with how this could be translated into a multi-part series. That is really key, that when we talk about IP, uh, that, that when somebody like Peter Roth looks at this, it's not so much that they're saying, oh, a theoretical idea. They're saying, if this, if this hits, if this works, it's, it's, it generates about four to five hundred million dollars for the company. So IP is really important and suddenly you're important in their eyes. So pitching it with that type of device I think is a way that I would suggest. Um, you know, I, the other thing that we got back from the report card, card on uh, Mafia Spies is that the audience, they tested in eight different countries as well as the United States, is that they said, was this fact-based? Was this true? And I guess in the era of Trump, everything we ask, is it true? How do we know it's true? And so uh, the fact that it's based upon a book with more than 500 footnotes uh, and all these other characters, Chris Matthews is in it, Tim Weiner from the New York Times, who wrote the book about the CIA and then the FBI, he's in it. James Kaplan, who wrote the biography, terrific biography of Frank Sinatra, who's also a big character in this, in this. Uh, he's in it. So, and it was interesting the way they put it all together. I learned a lot, but it's part, it's at the, I think it's at the tip of the spear of the, the world of streaming and where 
how Netflix is so documentary driven and such, um, and how you present that to an audience is still emerging. And so I think this will be a big part of that conversation. Um, and so uh, interestingly enough, uh, at, in July, I'll become a 68-year-old first-time novelist. Uh, and I have a little handout uh, <laughs> of both Mafia Spies, and it's called Montauk to Manhattan. And it's about a reporter who writes a novel that gets signed up by a big TV kind of a Harvey Weinstein character, and they make it out, they're making the TV uh, show out in Montauk at the same time the reporter is working for a well-known newspaper. It's the summer of 2016. He's like the third banana covering Trump in, that, in, in the rise of Trump. So um, that is not true. That's all made up. It's a novel. But uh, I have to say some of this experience did inform that novel. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. The short question is, how do you do it all? Let me uh, rephrase that. You're, you're working full time for a newspaper, and you're writing, what, five books and scripts, etc. You have a family. How is that possible? Um, well, you know what they pay at Newsday, you know, at any, <laughs> at any newspaper. Uh, so, you know, you have three kids, they want to go to college, you have to make a few bucks. Um, you know, I could have driven a truck or whatever, or I'd gotten a job at McDonald's. It's virtually the same amount of pay when you're writing books, at least initially. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I, but also I wanted to be a writer. That's, it only makes sense to me if you just say, I want to be a writer, and I'm just going to devote as much. Practically speaking, uh, being an investigative reporter, you're doing one subject very deep, but you're able to manage that more than if you're doing many subjects only so deep. But where do you find the time? Well, I would, I, in a nutshell, you I would, I, 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 barely, no. Um, I would, uh, and Joyce can attest to this, basically I would get home from Newsday about six to seven, we'd have dinner, and by nine o'clock, I would work from nine until one every night uh, and then get up shit faced and then go, you know, go to work the next day. Um, and then on weekends, I'd say about five to six hours, I'd try to sneak in. And, you know, Joe Berger and I were just talking about this. It's kind of like the squirrel that runs out and gets a nut and puts, a, puts the nut in the tree you know, preparing for winter. Uh, it's kind of like you run out every day. If you do something for the book every day, by the end of the year, lo and behold, you have a book. And it is manageable. I also write, I wrote about history. If I wrote, I didn't write anything off the news. If I did, I think that I would have been in a completely different circumstance. Uh, uh, there's a Newsday uh, editorial writer who just recently left the paper. He did a book about Santos and he found it necessary to leave. So, uh, but I was able to manage it that way. So you must incorporate events that you've shared with your colleagues. How do you approach the issue of intellectual property when you're relating stories told to you by your pals? I, you know, I, I have, I've never wrote a story uh, my favorite crime. I never wrote a book that was uh, as told to. I never wrote uh, a book that was the story of my beat. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I always wanted to do something that was different than what I was doing at Newsday. And I've been pretty circumspect about uh, what I'm writing. You know, I, I would tell people, I would put, put my cards on the table, I know when I did the Newhouse book, I, I don't think people were all that thrilled because Newsday had just gotten Parade Magazine from the Newhouses. Um, but um, they didn't interfere with that. I didn't, it, and it, I don't think it all affected my work. Actually, I think if I was an editor, God forbid, of, of a, a newspaper, I would look for multimedia uh, 
uh, writers who are who just are writing all the time who do books because I think that informs Newsday has had a tremendous not necessarily by design but has had Les Payne he just won the uh, posthumously won the won the uh, P Pulitzer for uh, uh, his biography of Malcolm X uh, Dan Fagan who worked at Newsday covered the environment. He won the Pulitzer about 10 years ago. A number of different people have written books. So, I, you know, I just think it's good. If The more you swing the bat, the more you learn about the world, the better you're going to be as a journalist. Um, yes? What was your role in actually writing the script? You hear stories about writers being at the bottom of, of the hierarchy and having no control over them. Well, I tried to get into the union of the writers, and uh, uh, that's a big difficulty, and it, it gets into health care and all these other different factors. Um, so um, I uh, would send memos to the showrunner of Masters of Sex, Michelle Ashford. From the very outset, we had a lot of conversations about how you start the show. Uh, the way the show started in the pilot is actually from chapter eight. And it's different than the way I started the book. When they asked me, though, I, I, uh, how do you think we should start it? And they knew what they had in mind anyway. Um, I said, oh, you should start it with that scene in chapter eight. So we were pretty much on the same, uh, but I did not write, because I'm not a member of the, of the writer's uh, union out there. Uh, I was not able to write uh, a script. Now I've. I've gotten into other contracts that should you make this into, Tom will become a writer that way. With a documentary, I'm more familiar with the form. Uh, and so I was more involved with this. I'm also, as you can see, I'm kind of the narrator for s the six part, you know, it's almost a six hour series. So I'm kind of the narrator. I move the ball along. There's a lot of people like Chris Matthews who talk about it. But uh, so I was much more involved with that, and uh, and that's why, like, I'm a producer. I was a producer with uh, Masters of Sex as well. Um, I think sometimes writers give away the store too quickly. I think I have a very, very good entertainment attorney out in Los Angeles. He's been a very close friend of mine for 20 years. Uh, he represents Nicholas Sparks. He's going to be in town next next month for uh, the Notebook. That's now a musical. And actually, we we are hoping Masters of Sex becomes a musical, believe it or not. <laughs> Pygmalion, My Fair Lady, Masters and Johnson. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, he looked out for me. I think some writers give out, I think they give away the store too quickly. They don't get credit, they don't get paid for things. And, and they should hold out for it. Uh, they'll, they'll cough it up if you have the right attorney. Um, yes. How do you describe being edited since your venues have varied? And as you know, some copy editors want a newspaper. I won't name which one. they very picky you. But, uh, some never, like never. Spain, We're on tape here. So how does it vary? Well, it's, it's a very different uh, situation. Uh, with, with newspapers, as I said, it, it is very hierarchical. Um, and, and so, it, 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 because you have to get the paper out the next day. A lot of it, that, that organization is because you have to be sure that you get the paper, that the paper shows up at the doorstep the following day. Um, you know, it, it, it depends. Um, generally speaking, um, I, I, you know, it's funny because with this, with Mafia Spies, we filmed it at a, uh, for three days, they put me up in a hotel, Joyce and I, we were at a hotel, but they filmed at a, uh, a former speakeasy on the east side here in Manhattan. And um, you just saw a little bit of that last clip, that's, that's where it was. And it initially started as a Q&A uh, about the book, and eventually I just said to the showrunner, I said, you know, we both read the book. We're both making this thing. Tell me, what exactly do you want me to say? Don't let me start you know, digressing and going off. 
And so, you know, they have their own needs. Uh, and they're very different from a newspaper's needs. And so eventually you kind of get the sense of that. We've laughed about that recently, that for that three days, it was just, okay, tell me exactly what you want to say. And then I, I practice just literally getting those lines out effectively in front of a camera. Tom, thank you. Yes. Thank you. First, thank you so much and congratulations on all your success. Thanks. Um, just to take you back a minute, so you told us, you mentioned you have a great entertainment lawyer. Did you or do you have a literary agent who is experienced in, you know, turning her clients' works into TV and movies? Yeah, right now I'm represented by the Gersh Agency, which is one of the bigger agencies out there. My, uh, my, uh, I've had two really terrific literary agents, though. Uh, in the past, uh, one was Faith Hamlin, was at Sanford Greenberger, and my uh, entertainment attorney is the counsel for the for them. That's in fact, um, that's how Nicholas Sparks. It was the same agency and such. This is back in like 1989, early 90s, um, and then I, the last few, the last 10 years or so, uh, I had another attorney, uh, excuse me, another literary agent, John Wright, and he passed away. Uh, he was he represented Robert Dalek and a number of other historians, biographers, and such. But yeah, you know, uh, basically, it's been my literary agents that have been uh, uh, really central to being uh, uh, putting and and Scott Schweimer, who is my entertainment attorney. Actually, as much as anybody, Scott has been the constant in my career. Why haven't you? Uh, oh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Joe. Um, why haven't you gone whole hog Hollywood? Uh, 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 give up, give up newspaper. Well, you know, I wrote a book about the Churchills and the Kennedys, and there was a scene in that book where Randolph Churchill, the only son of, of Winston, wanted to show that he was a brave guy. So he joined a, a group of commandos. I'm going to answer your question, I, honor, I promise. But there's a scene where they open up the door, and they're, they're, lying, they're flying low. It's in what is now, I guess, Hungary. And he slipped the guy uh, five pounds to give him a boot so he would jump out of the plane with the parachute because he would, he would just freeze in front of the door. I've been at that door several times <laughs> in the last 10 years. And every time I freeze, I say, ah, I like newspapers. Ah, we're not sure. Because you never really, we, uh, we, I had one project where we were going to Scotland and where it was all set, they were sending it, and, the, and the, the bottom fell out at the last minute. And we got a call on a Friday after, at, we had gone to dinner, and I looked like Lincoln after he had been shot. I mean, I just was sh stunned by that. So since then, I've learned, you know, bird in the hand, overly, perhaps overly cautiously. Uh, but I also like everybody who's ever worked in a newsroom. There's a certain cocaine aspect of the newsroom. That, you know, the news is fun. And, and to the extent that you can kind of keep your toe in there, or you know, your, part of your body at least, in there. Um, that, you know, that's how I've been able to balance it. Hello there, Cheryl. Cheryl, how's it going? Probably the most important question of this discussion. Why did you why did Masters and Johnson get divorced? <laughs> I am so glad you asked that question because we never got to that point. They ended it when they got married. There was like another 20 years. And that's why I said it was one of the great, amazing love stories. At the beginning of my book, I'm going to give you a quick answer. I'm going to try it. The beginning of my book, it's how Virginia Johnson loses her virginity. And she's 16 years old, and she's with a, a boy with, she described it, she wouldn't tell me his name, I found, uh, a boy with fiery red hair. I eventually found out from, and, and she was in a little town called Golden City, Missouri, population 800. Uh, and, and she described how she lost her virginity. I mean, after all, it is pertinent to the subject matter. Uh, and uh, so what happened is that Masters, all, Masters, uh, Bill Masters, had a lost love from his youth. Um, and uh, both of them had lost contact with, both, with the, their, the earliest loves. And then at the end of their lives, Masters bumps into this lost love and on Christmas Eve tells Virginia, that's it. No more, 
we're, up, we're done. And at the end of the book, Virginia Johnson goes back looking for her lost love, the boy with fiery red hair. And that's the end of the book, and I'm not going to spoil it for you. You'll have to read that book to find that out. <laughs> Um, are you writing for a specific audience? That's A. B, what do you think about the younger people now who are just coming into the media, uh, watching it, listening over the internet? Are you in including them in what you're trying to write about? Well, to be honest, I think I'm clueless to some extent. Uh, the fact that we have three sons in their 30s, my youngest son, is involved in the media. He's the one who keeps me grounded, explains certain things. Oh, Dad, okay, this is what this means, and stuff like that. Um, I do think the streaming world is a completely different world. I think they are flying by the seat of their pants. They may say, oh, we've got it, we've got it, don't worry. But they're flying by the seat of their pants. They know it. And anybody who's really involved with it knows it. And they're trying to find out what the audience wants. And who, you know, the, the, anyone under 35, probably any, anyone under, under 50, uh, is getting their television by a smart television with apps that have been installed or come installed already in it. And they decide what they want. And uh, watching Tony Gaida on channel four, which, right? Or two. Or two. <laughs> uh, they're finding. keep a gym. Well, no, <laughs> of course you could. Uh, um, they're finding Channel 2 and Channel 4 through uh, Pluto mm -hmm. and Tubi and all these other different uh, ad-driven uh, channels. And so basically, if you really step back and you look at television, um, you had the, uh, the rabbit ears era from the, what, the first 30, 40 years or so, then cable came its, into its own from the 1970s, really until about five years ago. And now we are in that third realm, which they thought would repeat cable television, the golden age. They thought, well, the streamers will be just like cable. But that, now they're finding, and with Mafia Spies, for instance, you get to a certain point, pause, and now you have an ad. You know, it's not, it's not ad-free like HBO or Showtime. There were no ads in, in uh, Masters of Sex, in Mafia Spies or any other type of really popular, hopefully popular with us, uh, but in streaming, it's, it's ad-driven as well. So I think the three stages of television were just beginning that third stage. And uh, I, I think that's, that's there. That, that's, you know, the younger generations. That's something that's very different from our experience. I started reading your book, Masters of Sex, and it's great. Thanks. Um, I have a special interest in this because um, I can't imagine how I missed it when it first came out, but I did. Uh, William, How William Masters was an alumnus of uh, Hamilton, class of 38. Yes. This is my alma mater. Uh -huh. And I was always wondering whether, I mean, it was at that time a very austere place. Uh, it was all male. Uh, snow fell from October to May. Um, if you wanted a date, uh, you sometimes had to drive 150 miles. Um, so I was kind of wondering whether uh, you picked up any sense that uh, I mean, it was a sex-starved, horny place <laughs> <laughs> before the girls got there. Uh, <laughs> Did, did, did that have anything to do with his obsession? Well, they were, it, Masters was really uh, wary of, of being perceived as some sex-starved pervert. He was a masterful uh, OBGYN. He was the well-known uh, OBGYN uh, out there. And so uh, the reason why he became partners with Virginia Johnson is that a lot of female doctors did not want to get involved with this. I mean, for masters, understanding how the body works through the fundamental act of procreation, how the pro progression of the species takes place, uh, and everybody knew that, but they didn't want to uh, detail it. Kinsey 
they, he was well aware that that shop had gone way off the rails uh, in terms of their private lives, and anybody who's familiar with either the Kinsey biographies or the, the movie understands that. So uh, Masters is almost like a Puritan in that regard, except that when he, the, the only person that he could get really was Virginia Johnson, who had this native understanding of how to convince nurses and doctors' wives and all these of volunteers to be part of their uh, sexual studies. It was Virginia who made everything possible. She also understood a lot about the treatment uh, that they used, and uh, which was a sensate, uh, basically a touch, uh, and uh, 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 it's escaping my, uh, my brain right now, the term, but it's basically teaching the body through touch and such. She developed that, and that was a very effective uh, technique. But, Masters, to, in a nutshell, was very wary of, of not being perceived as some, some nut. Thank you for uh, coming and enlightening people. Thank you.